Okay. Michael Stevenson, welcome to the show. Thank you. You published a book, The Last Full Measure, How Soldiers Die in Battle, which is a, a, a historical survey of human warfare and particularly how, how soldiers die in battle. I'm curious, what kickstarted that research project of yours? I was working as the editor for the Military Book Club in New York, and I was reading a ton of military history. But it seemed to me that quite often what was missing was a real understanding of what actually happens on the battlefield, that sometimes we have a kind of generalized and rather fuzzy view of it sometimes filtered, you know, through movies or through novels or whatever. And I wanted to find out, because it seemed to me important to honour those people who gave their lives by understanding exactly how it happened. And so I set out to try and trace it through, as far as I could, through the centuries, in order to get a sense of what was different, but also perhaps what uh, connected these things, what connected the experience of being in combat. And I was, you know, I was much more concerned about the combat experience than I was about, I mean, most soldiers who died in warfare died from disease, but that wasn't really my objective. I wanted to find out, if you like, what happened at the sharp end. And at the beginning of the book, you noted that this was, you were walking a tightrope with this book. What made writing this book Mm. or about this topic a challenge? I think it was that, uh, you know, you're writing about something that is by its nature gruesome. I mean, you know, whether you're talking about men being killed in the Greek phalanx or being killed by an IED in Iraq, this is gruesome stuff. But I think that it needs to be understood without it somehow becoming just another part of the sort of pornography of violence that attracts quite a lot of people to this subject. And how did you go about you know, ba- making that balance as you were writing this? I mean, were there moments where you thought, I got to pull back, or there were moments where I had to go a little bit further than maybe I want? It, it is hard because, you know, if you don't actually lay out what happens in battle in all its gruesomeness, you're not really getting to the truth of the experience. But on the other hand, you don't want it just to be a a sort of uh, gore fest. And so actually it just comes down to making individual decisions, whether the examples you use of how soldiers are killed progresses the argument or whether it's just thrown in just to be, you know, titillating. And I hope, well, I tried very hard not to let it be the latter and more the former. I think you succeeded with that. As you were researching, what factors were you looking for to figure out how how soldiers die in combat, how it's changed throughout history? Oh, I think it's, it's kind of specific in the sense that there are lots of factors that bring the soldiers to their death. Partly, you know, how does weaponry affect the ability to, um, what's their lethality of a weapon? What are the tactical context in which those weapons are used? And then something that's a bit harder to pinpoint, but it's important. What are the cultural drivers that lead men into battle and determine how they act in combat? That's a harder thing, but in a way, a kind of more interesting thing, because you could, you can, you know, trace the development of weaponry through the centuries and see, you know, do I have to be face to face with somebody in order to inflict a mortal wound or can I do it from a mile away? So that, that can be traced quite easily. It's much more difficult to trace, to chart, if you like, the social and cultural influences. And I, we'll probably talk about some of those cultural and social influence, but what's an example you know, that people might have heard about of how, you know, that might lead, that might contribute to how someone dies in war? I suppose it's partly about what society expects of the warrior, what the society who is sending that man into battle would expect them to do. So I suppose 
for a Greek citizen fighting as a hoplite in the phalanx, it might be very different from, say, a GI fighting in Iraq. And, you know, it's complicated to think about that. I mean, one of the issues about the book is um, it's such an enormous chronological spread so that, you know, what motivated a Greek citizen to fight in the hoplite would be somewhat different from, say, a man being conscripted into, let's say, the U.S. Army in World War II or in Vietnam. No, that that makes sense. Um, and as you said, you I mean, this is a, a comprehensive historical survey. I mean, you start, yeah. you try to go back as far as you can. And so, like, do we know, like, when humans started battling each other in an organized fashion? <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess that, uh, well, some historians say it was, you know, about 400,000 years ago when hominids, I guess, you know, there there must have been tribal conflicts. but. I think in terms of when recognizable weaponry comes in, it's probably about 40,000 years ago where you have the atlatl, which is a sort of spear, but a a projected one. You know, it's not just hand thrown as it must have been, you know, when humans were hunting animals, they had spears and they, they threw them, but, or stabbed them, but the atlatl comes into history about 40,000 years ago where men could actually throw dart-like missiles. And then 20,000 years ago, you have the bow and arrow, which, you know, ups the ante. But I would imagine that it starts, and it's quite interesting, I think it starts probably through territorial conflict. And I think as far as we know, the object obviously is is to win, but to win without suffering too many casualties yourself. So, in fact, the earliest warfare, this is this is my feeling about it, is not what we might call heroic warfare. It's not sort of charging, you know, man to man. It's more to do with ambushing because with ambushing, you get a high reward and with a much lower risk to you, the ambusher. And what's fascinating is that this early model, if you like, is really what we experience in very modern warfare, where guerrilla warfare is probably the predominant mode of combat at the moment. And it's the same kind of idea that ambush, whether it's using IEDs or in ancient, in prehistoric times, it would just be obviously you know, sticks that were hardened, uh, fire-hardened sticks or spears or thrusting in weapons gave you the advantage of surprise and also to be hidden from your enemy, which is very important. No, I mean, that's, you, you make the point that that idea of ambush and raids is, a, is, a, is an Eastern an Eastern type of warfare. Yeah. I um, mean, you even see it in amongst Native Americans. That's That was their preferred method of of fighting. Well, it, well, it's interesting this because when you look at it from a Western perspective, this form of warfare, which you've described, you know, Eastern North American Native Americans, was was despised by Europeans and white North Americans because it was considered to be cowardly. So when the Crusaders, for example, are invading Palestine. And the Holy Lands, they are deeply frustrated that the Muslims that they're fighting uh, won't actually just come up front and fight them. They they use horse archers to torment them. They try and draw out small units of European knights in order to, you know, cut them out. And it's interesting that, for example, U.S. cavalrymen fighting Indians in the 19th century make the same kind of comments about their opposition that the Crusaders did about the Muslims they were fighting in the 12th century. Well, let's talk about this this rise of this Western attitude and tactics towards warfare. And this seems to have developed uh, with the ancient Greeks. And you point out 
the Greeks' warfare, there's two ideas about what warfare was like for the ancient Greeks. On one side, yeah. you have this idea that ancient war was ruthlessly violent with high casualty rates. But then there's yeah. this other argument that ancient Greek warfare was actually just more of a ritualized shoving match. Yeah. What did your research find? I think both, actually. This is the problem. <laughs> both of those things can be, they're not mutually exclusive. So you can have the ritualized shoving match, which can be pretty bloody, particularly for the warriors who are in the front, you know, two or three ranks. I mean, what tends to happen is this, that the, there's a face-off usually between the, the opposing sides. And then there's this very interesting kind of dynamic, maybe that's not quite the right word, a kind of lightning strike, where one side decides to really start moving forward and they start to pick up speed and they want to get through the killing zone, the missile killing zone of, you know, arrows and spears as quickly as they can and to lock in with their opponents. And that can be very bloody in the, in the front ranks. But I think at some point, it's a little bit like how animals fight at some point one side decides that that's enough. And it must be a very extraordinary experience because I think it's just somehow communicated, you know, through the ranks that we are losing or we are winning. And they give way. And the point in Greek warfare, which is pretty common up until fairly modern times, is that it's about the ground you can claim. And that gives you the victory, not necessarily that you've, that you've inflicted more casualties because you might not have, but they might just have decided that that was enough. And in Greek warfare, you know, you have two really conflicting ideas. One is that the phalanx, which is made up of citizen warriors, they value their lives because they have to go back, you know, they're farmers, they're traders or whatever. They value their lives. They don't want to give their lives away in some sort of crazy blood fest. So they're willing to make kind of compromises. And yet from what we understand through, you know, through Homer and the Iliad is that you have this idea of the individual warrior, this individual hero who goes and does battle with his peer. And so this is considered, and it is a very profound model for the Western idea of warfare, and actually not just Western, I mean, in Japan, it, it's true as well. And and actually amongst, um, amongst um, North American Indians, it's true as well, that the the leader has to proclaim himself. I mean, in the Iliad, you know, all we learn about are the names of the great warriors, Hector and Patrocles and so on. We don't learn the names of anybody else. And so th throughout history, it seems to me that one of the things that's fascinating is the idea of the individual who can sacrifice himself and be remembered by his name. Think of the medieval knight with his proclamation, if you like, the samurai warrior with the same kind of proclamation that I am an individual, I will be remembered by my name, and then all the rest who are dumped into, you know, mass graves at the end of the battle. So, you know, we've been talking high level with the ancient Greeks and how their tactics yeah. may have influenced how they might have died in battle, but specifically, like, do we have any idea what was the cause of most casualties during ancient Greece? I think probably most casualties were caused by spear wounds and sword wounds. But actually, one of the things that um, is, is overlooked a little bit is that, you know, this was a huge number of people coming together. And a lot of people were simply crushed. <laughs> they were crushed because the two armies come together. They're both pushing against each other. The rear the rear ranks are pushing forward and pushing the people in the front ranks forward who then trip, fall, and are suffocated. This is true certainly in medieval warfare. It's certainly true in Greek warfare. 
where you have such a, a large number of troops in a small area. So it's, it's not, it's not usually thought of much, but, um, I would say that that was a contributory factor. And something that you note with the Greeks and the Romans, and this carries through to the even the medieval era, but particularly the Romans and the Greeks, they had they used weapons like artillery that you know missiles, but at the same time they had a disdain for it. They thought it was less manly or less yeah. you know, virile. I think, I think this is a very interesting point actually because I think that okay, so the heroic model, if you like, is set up by one man fighting another man. Now it might be one heroic you know, leader fighting another man, uh, whether it's Greek or whether it's the medieval knight. <clears throat> and, but as, as the weaponry develops, then missiles become more and more important. So, for example, you do not find a medieval knight using a bow and arrow. And there's a certain disdain for it because it's, it's connected in a way to a kind of, um, Social context, for example, the idea that somebody who just happens to be trained as, say, uh, an archer or a crossbowman could kill a nobleman, you know, from 200 yards, 300 yards or whatever, with crossbow actually a lot longer than that, was considered to be deeply immoral. And so you find in up to a I would say up to the 18th century, this idea that um, that somehow missile warfare is unfair because it robs the nobleman, it robs the socially privileged of their honour. And, for example, in the 15th century, if you were a crossbowman and you were captured there was a papal decree that said that you, well, of, they would often just be killed, but that you would have one of your hands chopped off so that you couldn't do that again. So there was a deep mistrust of missile warfare as being non-heroic. So listen, you, know, you mentioned the medieval knight, that they, had, they still had this idea of the, the single man going out and, and doing battle. And that's typically when people think of medieval warfare, they think of that. They think of the knight in armor, riding on a horse. But you highlight that, you know, that's not how most medieval battles went. There, there were other people there fighting as well. Yes. So who were those people yes. and what was a, a medieval battle like? I think it was a sort of, I've got a feeling that most battles whether it was Greek or medieval, where it comes down to, you know, men with with axes, with swords, with hammers, often with agricultural implements that have been adapted to warfare, that what happens is a sort of absolutely appalling scrum. So, as you know, the knights very often didn't fight on horseback they fought dismounted and even if they were fighting on horseback you know they were very vulnerable and once they were dismounted even though i mean the 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 misconception is of course that the knights were so heavily armored that they couldn't move they were like sort of turtles that have been turned on their backs which is not true the armorers were incredibly skilled, and these knights had a lot of mobility. But nevertheless, you know, they could be swarmed. Swarming a knight was, you know, usually the way in which they died, and they could be stabbed through the visor. There were all kinds of vulnerabilities through the armpits, through the crotch, you know, just being hammered. I mean, in Agincourt, the French knights who managed because of their hubris managed to, and also it was a very muddy battlefield, managed to get mired in the mud. And the English archers who had mallets, they were called mauls, which they used to hammer in the stakes from which behind which they would be protected, went out onto the battlefield and literally beat the knights to death. And it was appalling. And it wasn't at all heroic. And you can imagine the the catastrophe of a scrum of knights all writhing around in the mud being set upon by all of these men, of course, these villains, as they were called, who 
they despised. And uh, so at Agincourt, for example, in 1415, Henry V has this rather difficult decision to make. He's he's captured a lot of French knights. And normally the protocol would have been that these knights would have been spared and uh, ransomed. But then he's told that it's suspected that there's another French force coming. And he's, his concern is that he has this bunch of French knights, some hundreds, in his rear as captives. And if this French force somehow links up with them, he would be in a very difficult position. So he gives permission for his archers to kill the knights. And this is considered an absolute abrogation of the chivalric code. But he does it anyway. Well, that's another interesting point that you bring up throughout the book is the treatment of prisoners of war. Yeah. Because we think it's sort of a given now because you've had the Geneva Convention for you know most of the 20th century. But yeah. for most of human history, there was just basically give no quarter was the, the rule. I think it's often, often the rule. I don't think it happens always, but... Um, you know, I mean, there are plenty of there are plenty of examples of it, of of prisoners being killed out of hand in quite, you know, in, in modern warfare. I mean, I think in the heat of battle, all kinds of things happen. Uh, we would like to think that men behave with some kind of humanity, and, and, and often they do. And one of the things that moves me very much is reading accounts of soldiers who who kill an enemy and then have this realization that it could have been them you know th- what i mean is that there's a connection of a shared humanity which is devastating to to some of these soldiers and yet you know i mean it's full of contradiction you have that you have this devastating sense that you've done something that is is absolutely irrevocable and irreparable you've taken somebody's life and then there are other men who just think it's great you know they have a great joy in killing but so you know yes there are all kinds of so-called conventions about prisoners of war but they're often breached and breached for all kinds of reasons, a bit like the reasons that I said about Henry V at Agincourt, you know, because it's just safer. For example, in the First World War, if there were trench raids, you did not take prisoners. You got into the first trench and you killed every man that was in that trench. I mean, the wounded, it doesn't matter. You killed them all because you couldn't have the possibility of these people suddenly being a threat to you in your rear. So they, they had to be killed. And that was just one of the facts of that kind of warfare. So up through the medieval era, and then I guess the, I guess starting the 17th century, the 18th century, you see the introduction of firearms, gunpowder. How did that? How did that change warfare? Well, I think what use is the knight if all of that armor can be breached by? a ballistic missile fired by somebody from, you know, 100, 200 yards away. And so from about 1600, what happens to the armored knight? I mean, it's interesting in the English Civil War, which is, you know, the 1640s, you still have noble soldiers in pretty much full, in full armor. For example, at the Battle of Edgbaston, the Duke of Northumberland is unhorsed and they have to, he's, he was a royalist and they, the parliamentary soldiers who unhorse him have to actually take his helmet off in order to chop his head off. But when you look at that period, the 1640s, very few noble soldiers are wearing armor, you know, buckskin. Mobility is much more important. So buckskin, yes, they wear a helmet, as we still do today, but you do not see the armor other than the knight in full armor anymore because the gun 
has revolutionized the battlefield. But you know, it took a while for the gun to actually make a significant difference because early firearms were incredibly inaccurate. Yes, they were. Yes. Uh, right up until, I suppose, mid 19th century. I mean, you know, they were, they were pretty inaccurate um, in, the, in the American Civil War. And I think one of the things is not just about whether the weapon itself is accurate, and, and often, you know, up until, what are we talking about, till the 1870s, 1880s, they were pretty wildly inaccurate. But it's also about what happens in the context of a battle, in the context of combat, so that you have lots and lots and lots of examples of men who, even with you know, rifled muskets in the Civil War, they they load them, you know, five, six times. Men forget to take out the the rammers because it's such a panic. It the stress is so extraordinary that even men with relatively accurate weapons don't use them properly. So for example, the ramrods are, you know, you have to, I'm thinking about the War of Independence, particularly, the ramrods are stuck into the earth, because you cannot keep putting the ramrod back in its, its holder in the musket, you just stick it in the earth, and you ram it down the musket. And of course, the earth begins after a while to jam it up. And so, even, you know, right from the beginning of gun warfare, there's the inaccuracy of the weapon itself and the inability of the soldier to use it properly. And, and because in you know, early gun warfare, the, because the guns you know took a relatively long time to reload yeah. and they weren't accurate, one of the things that commanders did is they basically bunched people up together. Yes. So you'd have you know, rows and then and it, but they basically did warfare like they did in, in medieval time, you know, just like one side yeah. on one side, the other side on the other. Sure. And first line would shoot their thing and then the next line would shoot and they kind of you know reload. But that actually made you more susceptible because people would just aim at that. At that that grouping of people, yeah, I mean, yeah, I suppose you know the, the the, but you have lots of occasions where I mean, here are a couple of things. One is that, you know, people say, oh, this is the American Civil War, the highest lethality of any war in history, which you know maybe would be true, but then there are lots and lots of of anecdotes about how much lead had to be expended. To kill a man. I mean, the, the joke was that you needed to fire as much lead as a man weighed to kill one man. So you have these two rather contradictory things. That, And I think what it is, is that if you take the whole picture, you can make an argument that, you know, the lethality is not quite as great as one might imagine. But if you take more localized things like Oh, you know, certain regiments in certain battles. The lethality is absolutely horrific where you have frontal attacks against prepared defenses. And you're right, you know, because you had to get men close together to make that discharge count, it could count very horribly um, if you were close enough. And the one thing that it seemed like... <laughs> Extremely terrifying. This, I think, you know, um, goes through even modern warfare when the direction of gun gunpowder was artillery, you know, cannonballs. Like that seemed to be the thing that a lot of soldiers were afraid of the most. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's more spectacular, isn't it? I mean, if you see somebody hit by a cannonball, it's a very different experience of seeing somebody hit by a mini A ball. And, you know, talking about some um, civil war again, but, um, it's just so much more dramatic. And this is true, I think, uh, you know, in the First World War and the Second World War. I think what soldiers really feared most was artillery because it's probably true that in the First World War and the Second World War, artillery was the most lethal thing that soldiers faced. But there's something else too, and that is you're completely helpless. To be under an artillery bombardment is to be absolutely without any defense whatsoever. 
And that was horrifying. And I think that's what frightened most soldiers more than probably any other kind of weaponry. And then speaking of sort of the cultural and social influence on how that influenced the way soldiers died, the point you made, officers were expected to still lead from the front. They were expected to yes. you know, be cool in the face of battle. And so as a consequence yeah. of that, officers had the highest lethality rate during the 18th, 19th century. Yes, not just the 18th, 19th century, but looking at certainly at World War One, the officer fatalities as a percentage were much, much higher. So you have this thing which goes way back, doesn't it? It goes way back to the beginning of warfare, which is that, and this interests me quite a lot, this you have a military structure which says, here are the here are the officers, and they're going to lead you, and they are going to take the highest risks because they're out front. And what does that reflect up until probably quite recently, up until probably the Second World War? The officers reflect a social division. The officers, just like the Greek warriors in the Iliad, just like the medieval knight, the in the 18th century, the officers represent a social distinction. Now, this is this fascinates me, that they aren't necessarily militarily the most effective. It's not the most effective way to deal with things, because after all, if your officers aren't particularly trained, you know, they can do some pretty damaging things to the men and to the outcome of the battle. But up until World War II, I'd say, Officers were designated by social class. And sometimes, and many times, they were very effective. Because if you take the medieval knight as representing an officer, you know, they've been trained for most of their life to do this stuff. But it isn't always true in the sense that, you know, to become an officer in, in the 18th century, 19th century army often meant it, you, you got there because of your social position rather than because of your military training. And I think that broke down, obviously, in World War One. Well, actually, it's, it's primarily true in World War One. The officer class is still a socially elevated class. World War Two, I suppose, breaks it down pretty completely. And I would imagine now in modern armies, it's almost entirely gone. Uh, that it's you know merit merit gets you your status as an officer rather than social background. Not not entirely actually. I still say to some extent it's true today in that um, you know if you come from a military background, you tend to come from a certain kind of social class. To, I don't know whether I mean it'd be an interesting thing to look at. You make the point with the Civil War, the nineteenth century, that we start to see this. It's sort of like a transition point between ancient to modern warfare. Yeah. What happened there? Do you think that made that transition? Oh, I think just the lethality of weaponry. But I think in the sense that if you look at it from the very earliest to the most modern, there's some idea about distance, that the heroic is defined by closeness, closeness to your enemy. You know, with North American Indians, it wasn't necessarily that you had to kill your opponent, but you had to touch him, i.e. you had to get close to show your bravery. Well, you can be killed by a sniper from a mile and a half. You can be killed by an IED, which has been laid by somebody, you know, two weeks before and set off with a mobile phone from, you know, a mile away. And so that idea of of proximity has evaporated as weapons become more effective from a longer range. And now we've got to a situation, in fact, where you don't actually need people at all. You know, drone warfare and one imagines, you know, smart weapons on the battlefield begin to make the role of the human less and less important. And then, I mean, another... So you know, after the Civil War, you had the, the Boer War in South Africa, which was another sort of transition from sort of that ancient warfare to modern warfare. You see more mechanization. And then World War I, I mean, that's sort of noted as the war that ended any romantization of warfare, that sort of heroic ideal. I mean, Hemingway, the Lost Generation, all made the case that World War I just ended yeah. words like courage and honor. 
what changed? Like, what was it? Just the pure mechanization, the 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 machine gun, the 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 chemical gas. Was that the thing that just sucked out any sense? Oh, of- I think I think you're looking at just being over totally overwhelmed by the weaponry available. I mean, you have artillery of extraordinary accuracy and massive power. You know, you have mass troops going against machine guns. Gas, I think, is a less, I don't know, gas, I think, has a lot of sort of dramatic impact. I'm not sure that it accounts for huge numbers of casualties. I I think probably artillery and, you know, machine guns were the primary killers in World War I. And there's a kind of anonymity that, I mean, it's it's shocking to me that um, when you go and look at the uh, cemeteries, in France and Belgium, First World War cemeteries, how many men weren't even found? The men in Gate, I think, has about 50,000 names of men who were, ne- their bodies were never recovered. You know, artillery simply evaporated them and, or buried them or whatever. And this idea of uh, just never even being recovered, you know, it's just extraordinary. That That is, if you want to put it crudely, that is the most anti-heroic way you can be killed in warfare. I mean, another thing, I mean, you, know, you said men, but oftentimes these were boys. These were oh, yeah. 16-year-old, yeah. 17-year-old boys yeah. who, who died during World War One. Yeah. It's interesting, this, because I think reading quite a lot about World War One, which happens to interest me particularly, I think British... People are particularly fascinated by it in a way that Americans aren't, only in that, you know, the losses involved were so much more impactful on British society than they were on American society. But, um, you know, the, the enthusiasm with which these young men joined up and also the, uh, the, what you might call the lax, criteria there were f- for allowing young men in you just you know you just lied you just said you know i was 17 last birthday and they go are you sure and they yes you're in but there was great enthusiasm for this war which actually wasn't entirely extinguished i mean we think that god if you'd been through that experience and yet a lot of men still held steadfast to their belief in the necessity of the war. And and it inter- this interests me quite a lot in that um, what happens, I think, is that societies construct the scaffolding, the, the uh, ideological scaffolding that is meant to make men want to fight. But actually, once men are in warfare and they see what it's like, they create their own internal motivation. And it's usually attached to their unit, their buddies, their friends, and they they disconnect from the social, you know, these are the reasons why we're fighting men, get out there. They disconnect from all that, and that's why you find in the First World War and the Second World War why men actually rather dreaded going back to, say, in this to Britain on leave because they were going back to a group of people who didn't really understand at all what they were going through, and often they just wanted to get back to their unit, even though it was going to be a very, very dangerous thing to do, because they wanted to be back with men who understood what they were going through. And this is critical, I think, throughout history, that the soldier has to know that what he's doing is at least um, recognized. And the only people that usually can recognize it are the people that are also going through what you're going through. No, Sebastian Younger, the journalist, in his book Tribe, he makes that point as well. And it still happens today. Like soldiers oh, yes. get back because yes, it it's not because they not necessarily they believe in the 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 bigger mission, right, for the, yeah. the nation state, but it's like they want to get back to their to their buddies. Well, I think I think when you look at soldiers who've been in Iraq and Afghanistan and, and in Vietnam, I mean, they feel in a way that they're in a vacuum that some um, that nobody really understands what, that's why PTSD is so appalling and so prevalent. 
is that they carry this experience inside of them and they cannot find a way to express it, or so many of them can't, because, you know, what have we done? We have, we don't have conscripts anymore. We don't have national service anymore. We just send these professional soldiers out there and um, they feel in a way abandoned, I think, and particularly when they come back. And something that's interesting about starting, I mean, I would say the 18th century, but particularly in the Civil War and especially in World War One and World War Two, we actually have diaries and letters from men fighting. And as a result, you're able to get, you know, see this, a, a ghastly picture. Some of these guys got very yeah. detailed in explaining how a buddy next to him, you know, one minute laughing, next minute you know, dead, it was, you know, I mean, yeah. in, in a very ghastly way. Yeah. And I mean, some of the more, more haunting descriptions you provide in the book, it was particularly in World War One. I, I mean, people forget this about artillery shells. Sometimes they would, you know, detonate above you, yes. but the air blast would just, just devastate your internal organs and kill you. And soldiers yes. would stumble upon groups of men that just look like they're just lying. They still look kind of alive, but they're, they're not. Well, I think that must've been, you know, that is the weirdest thing because there are accounts not just from World War I, but thinking of an account from the American Revolutionary War where a cannonball passes so close to a man's head that he's killed instantly without any mark on him at all. And it's because the shockwave of the ball has killed him. And I think, you know, it must have been horrifying to come across soldiers who've been killed without really any mark on them. Of course, normally there were plenty of marks, but um, it was so it was so abhorrent uh, and shocking. But yes, you're right. I mean, you know, you could be killed. There's a there's a an anecdote of a soldier in the European theater in World War II. He's way behind the lines. He's in a tent where they're showing a film. He's leaning forward with his elbows on his knees. There is a shell burst from a long, long way away, and a piece of shrapnel kills him through the back from, you know, two miles away. And uh, it's as though death finds a way to reach out (laughs) in some bizarre way that you cannot account for. And I mean, the other thing that struck me, particularly from the letters and diary entries from World War One, was just how common death became. And mm. it became like just another thing that happened. Like some, you know, you, I think there's a journal entry from a, a British officer where they're having tea. Yeah. Artillery blew up. And then, you know, a couple guys, a guy died and it was blood everywhere. And they yeah. you know, cleaned it up and they just kind of kicked dirt over the blood. And then they kept going with their, their tea. I mean, they became very callous to it because they had to, to survive. But, you know, this is part of something else. I mean, I think the anecdote you're referring to are officers who are taking tea. Right. That's, you know, it was part of, uh, and I would imagine you're describing British officers. Correct. But it was part of the social expectation of that class that you did not show undue emotion in a situation like that, you know. There had to be sans foi. So, for example, at the Battle of Waterloo, General Paget is riding alongside Wellington, and Paget is hit by a cannonball, and it takes off his right leg. And he's still in the saddle, and he turns to Wellington and he says, my lord, I've just lost my leg. And Wellington turns to him and says, good God, sir, so you have. And that's it. Paget actually survives, goes on to father, I think, about 12 children. But, um, you know, that idea that you did not show any shock in the face of the most shocking and horrible thing was actually something that your class taught you. All right, moving into World War II, there were new technologies that brought new ways for soldiers to die. There were bomber and fighter planes and parachutists, as well as amphibious warfare. And when people think of World War II, they typically think of D-Day, of Normandy. And the way you described it, and in the letters and diaries from soldiers, 
there were so many ways to die when invading the beach, sometimes even before you got onto the beach. There's, um, there's a, an anecdote in my book where one of the landing craft captains, pilots, whatever, just gets into a complete funk and, you know, they're being shelled and whatever. And he just lowers the ramp. And these heavily, you know, I mean, these soldiers are carrying 60, 70 pounds worth of stuff. But he lowers the ramp into 15 feet of water. And the men just go over. And, of course, they drown. Uh, and about, you know, 20 of men do this until the men behind them just say, I'm not, you know, this is wrong. I'm not doing this. And so, yes, you could, you, you could drown. You, you could be wounded and just drown because you can't struggle anymore. I mean, there's just a ton of ways in which you can die. Yeah. And then you get on the, the beach, there could be mines. Oh, gosh. You have to worry about artillery shelling. I mean, I mean, there's things you don't think about when you think about World War II. Well, I think, you know, I, you know that, you know, Saving Private Ryan, the movie. Yeah. The, f- the first 15 minutes or so of that movie are absolutely extraordinary. Yeah. As an evocation of what it must have been like. So that, that brings us to today. And as you mentioned earlier, we're, st- you're, we're starting to see a return to the past of how you know, we're yeah. going back to that raid, guerrilla warfare, uh, asymmetrical yeah. warfare. Yeah, and that's changing the way soldiers die again. It is, and it changes the way in which they feel about their sacrifice. I think because you know they're being killed at long distance. You know they're being sniped. They're being killed by buried, you know, IEDs and mines. They can't identify their enemy. This comes across, as you know, very strongly in in uh, soldiers' accounts of fighting in the Vietnam War and in Afghanistan and in Iraq. What's it, you know, who's the, who's the civilian? Who's the, who's the enemy? And that feeling of frustration. And it's, it's, it's a double whammy because, first of all, you can't hit back at the enemy. You can't identify them. And then you're killing innocent people that is horrifying to you, horrifying to most human beings. And... So where is the heroic confrontation in this? And it's interesting that um, in in sort of popular culture, and I'm talking about popular American culture particularly, no, no and, and British culture too, it's the sniper who is identified as the heroic character. And it's the... And it's, you know, it's the seal or the special, special operations sort of counter-guerrilla fighter who is considered to be heroic because they at least have a chance to hit back. Given the fact that facing death in battle throughout history has always been such a terrifying, terrible prospect, how do you think men did it and were able to face it? I think that they were propelled not by some surge of patriotic energy, you know, let's do this for the motherland, the fatherland, whichever land, but they did it because their buddies expected it of them. My father went to, my father was in the British Army six years. And I would say to him, well, you know, what made you do that? What did you feel? I mean, was it that you were passionately anti-Nazi and so on? And he said, oh, well, of course we hated Hitler, but he didn't do it for ideological reasons. He did it because... There was peer pressure to do it. Oh, my buddies were, my friends were signing up, so I signed up. And I think that drives you forward. It's um, And it's not, you know, I'm going to be heroic, I'm going to get out there and I'm going to take out that machine gun nest. I'm sure there were, you know, there are exceptional human beings who do that kind of thing. But for most people it was. And it moves me terribly when I think about Civil War battles where, I'm thinking about the Irish Brigade going up the hill at Mary's Height, and they're descri- and they're under just ferocious fire, and they're described as pulling their caps down and bending their heads into the fire and going forward. Well, that is a kind of heroism that is just beyond words, really. Uh, Michael, I mean, after you, you people read this book, I mean, what do you hope they? What do, you, what do you hope they walk away thinking after they finish, they put it down? 
I hope that there's some feeling of humanity about this. This book was never written in order to glorify warfare. In fact, quite the opposite. I want people, I wanted people to understand exactly what does happen on the battlefield. And, you know, I'd hope that, you know, I end the book with a, I end the book with a letter from uh, an American Vietnam veteran. And he's writing this letter, which he, he puts into the wall of remembrance in Washington, but it's written to a Vietnamese soldier whom he kills, whom he has killed. And he's asking for forgiveness for this. And, um, I wanted to end the book on that note rather than some either triumphal note or some sort of geeky technological, you know, look into the future. No, I think that, I mean, it hit on some of the patent. I mean, the thing that I got from this was, War, it's it's a it's a terrible thing, but it's a very human thing. Yes, and you know, I don't, we have to we have to figure it out. It's something we have to digest and, and and really understand if we really want to understand ourselves. Well, I think it goes into the deepest parts of us, and um, you know, it's a profound and and complicated thing to deal with. And you know, the flag wavers and the jingoists just represent one small and not, I think, very honourable part of it. And I wanted to, and, and, you know, the book has lots of contradictory things in it, but that's the nature of the business, isn't it? It is. Well, Michael Stevenson, thanks so much for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. My guest today was Michael Stevenson. He's the author of the book, The Last Full Measure, How Soldiers Die in Battle. It's available on amazon.com and bookstores everywhere. Check out our show notes at aom.is slash measure, where you can find links to resources where we delve deeper into this topic.